please give a huge round of applause to Gareth Quinn. Thank you, David. Um, I haven't spoken in millions of times. It's my first time speaking ever, just to lower expectations. So, um, my story is going to be around, I'm going to tell you a story about me, um, a very unorthodox story, um, and how a thing called imposter syndrome, something which, whenever I was your age, I didn't even know existed, but something in retrospect which um, has held me back, I guess, or I think it has held me back. So, we're just going to bring up the, the first slide, if that's all right. Clicker, oh, here we go. I just mean this. So yes, so first of all, so my journey, I started, I was born at the foot of the Morn Mountains um, back quite a while ago actually and from there, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I went from here to working with my, the club that I supported all my life and loved and never thought I would get anywhere near this place which is the Carrington Training Complex in Manchester, uh, Southside Manchester. I used to Google this place as a, as a kid, do the Google Maps thing to see it all of a sudden now working with these guys through the company that we have at the moment. So I'm going to tell you how I got there and I'm also going to tell you a little bit about how our paths crossed with St. Romans before on my journey which is a bit of a coincidence and a bit uh, ironic more than anything else. I have a lot of sites to get through so I'm going to go through quite quickly. First of all, imposter syndrome, hands up, anybody ever heard of this thing called imposter syndrome before? Hands up, anybody suffered from it before? Or feel you've suffered from it before? So imposter syndrome really is a simple thing, it's the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved, alright? So probably a few more people in the room can relate to that a little bit more. That sense of not being valued, that sense of not knowing that you have a worth in whatever it is that you might be doing. There's a guy called Bertrand Russell, a philosopher. He said the whole, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. So if you are one of those people who does suffer from that imposter syndrome, it probably means you're a lot smarter than a lot of people around you, certainly the person beside you. So the uh, imposter syndrome as well affects many people. Cheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, she says that she's always thought that someday people would catch her out and the gig would be up. One of the most influential uh, women in the world from a business perspective. Maya Angelou, who's a famous civil rights uh, activist as well. Again, she wrote written 11 books about her experiences and she thought that people were going to find her out after that period of time as well. Other people like Emma Watson, the actress, she said that she constantly feels like an imposter. These are people who are at the top of their game and, and achieving over and over and over again. And then Ariana Huffington, she talks about the voice in her head. She talks about that, um, <coughs> that obnoxious roommate, the person who's always talking at her, telling her that she's not good enough. These are some of the most famous people in the world who suffered from imposter syndrome. So, my own orthodox story to try and relate this a little bit to me and back to you guys is I was born in this little place here called Addy Hall, which is in South Down, just outside Kilkee. Kilkee is very like Durgan. You know, back in my days growing up, it was a very divided town. You know, my side of the community walked down one side of the street, the other side of the community walked down the other side of the street. Um, but it still was a great place, and that was just normal, normal for us. This is my school, St. Louis Grammar School in Kilkee. So to get here, I had to do what was called the 11 plus um, back then. And like everything, as I was growing up, while not at all, as well I was growing up, I was never good enough. Whether it was the local GEA team, like Michael, I was hugely passionate about playing football for Addy Hall, which was like a second division, third division, county kind of young team. But it was never that good. I always played corner forward. I always be told to play corner forward and never really got past the ball. And always felt it was that I wasn't good enough to play football. Likewise, I never wanted to get into St. Louis Grammar School. Um, whenever I tried to get in here, the 11 plus, the dumping 11 plus came up. And I was put through reams and reams of practice tests. I was constantly reminded of how smart my cousins were, and my relations were, and my neighbours were, and how I pushed, pushed really, really hard to try and get the transfer test. And luckily for them, I was able to scrape through what was a B back then. And thankfully, I was able to scrape into St. Louis Grammar School. Um, and then again, got into the school and felt very much uh, again out of my depth whenever I was in school. Again, through first year, second year, third year, never good enough. Getting results in French is like 7%, which is nearly impossible to get. But I was getting those really, really bad results the whole way through. Got to my GCSE again, and again, straight through. Got an A in business studies, um, which sort of told the deal of my passion and where I wanted to go. But everything else was straight through, C, D's, and E's back at that point in time. But back then it was easier to get into A levels than what it is now, and thankfully I was able to scrape into, into my A levels. Did my A levels, and again, straight through once more. Got a, got a B, a C, and an E in my A levels, and scraped into university. 
um, straight into university. Over that period of time, when I was a sort of teenager, one of the things that was a blessing to me was all the different weird and wonderful jobs that I had. So I used to work in a recycling plant, so dirty and stuff in the beer bottles, wine bottles. I used to take off the metal caps and put them all in the green and clear bins and brown bins. I worked as a welder whenever I was 15, which has been a nightmare job, um, making a gate post for farms. I worked in a fish factory, which was a more stinking than you could ever, you could ever imagine. Um, worked in a bar, I got a little bit older then as well, serving so behind the bar, taking glasses. I worked fitting windows, uh, and I also worked then in a local safe place. So they were just some of the jobs that I had pretty, pretty much when I was 14 years of age, sort of right through. What that is still, I guess, in retrospect, was a, was a work ethic. I then went on to university to say, so in the university, I did a course called Computing and Information Systems, which again I scraped into. The only reason I got into it was because I befriended the receptionist lady, who was the one who actually put the list together of all the kids who were able to go into the course. And I was able, that's a true story, so I was able to get into, into this course. While I was there, um, first year of university, um, obviously I had my first drink for my first time. You guys will be able to do the same in the next year or two. And uh, while I had that, I independence sort of took over a little bit more than what I should have. Uh, and unfortunately, for your first year I failed it all miserably. I was actually picked out of the university in the first year and then had to go back and repeat. Um, and what I did was I did a degree then part time. So I had to do a HND, step in the HND at that point, and then work back up into the, into the degree. It took about six years actually to complete all of that through the Austin University. At this time, this is probably one of the first times, apart from the work ethic side, where I started to get a pain and a bit of value. And the big moment for me was this a really terrible picture. But if you remember back, I was a little guy playing corner forward for Ali Paul with this height, not nobody passed the ball to me, not being very valued and not feeling good about it. But whenever I went to Jordanstown University, nobody knew me, especially the football team in the year 2000, I became part of the freshest panel. Now, I was probably the worst player on that panel, but again, I was able to make it into the panel and we went on there and we won the All-Ireland Freshers that year in 2000. So that was one of the first times where I realised that you can achieve things, even though you might think about the value. So, this is me just in the corner here. Still one of the smaller type of players. So, even, so while I was studying in university, I then went in and got this job in the electoral office for Northern Ireland. It was a really, really poor job, processing loads and loads of forms, literally hundreds of thousands of forms over and over again. Um, and then this job came up to become a thing called the Area Electoral Officer in North and West Belfast. Really, really responsible job. And what you were, what, I mean, what you were be doing here is a number of very, very important things. I applied for the job uh, for experience. Because the salary was so bad at the time, and because no one wanted to work in North and West Belfast, especially for elections in the early 2000s, I ended up getting a job. So a completely random break, completely out of the depth, but again, started to get the value. My job was to organise things like over 100 canvassers who moved around North and West Belfast. I had to organise over 60 polling stations across North and West Belfast, around different interfaces and, and different political divides. And I had to organise town centres. And I remember the time my mum said to me, so what is he doing now? And I tried to explain this to me. And they never believed me, because obviously this guy from Addie Paul doing something like this. But again, I was just getting out of my depth. A bit like Michael, whenever he went in, and that volunteer and never invited to the director. He just embraced it. You know, he, he got a bit of a passion for it, and he wanted to prove everybody wrong. And thankfully that went well for me. The next step for me then was in the City Hall, Belfast. So I got a job then in the Lord, it's actually the Lord Mayor's office. So this guy from Addie Paul, he couldn't string a sentence together. You know, we can understand all of a sudden I'm in the Lord Mayor's office, advising the Lord Mayor of the day on uh, what he used to say they should do, what events they should run, and then I started actually trying to write speeches for the Lord Mayor of Belfast as well. Um, so all this sort of random stuff happened. And it was really here that I realised two things that I was organising, like dinners, this is a dinner in the Lord Mayor's parlour, I started to realise the vital importance of relationships and the conversations that could have around tables like this when people are sitting beside each other, building up relationships, building up empathy around common issues and wanting to go and do something and change things. But the big learning for me was relationships. The other thing for me that, was that I realised at this point in time was again what you can achieve whenever you want to. So my boss at the time, I told him the passion for business and he said, well, go and do something in the world and study something uh, in the world of business. So I decided to go and do an MBA at the time. So that would be like your, your top business qualification that you get, a Master's in Business Administration is what it's called. So I did that, it was a three year course. And because I just hated the idea of doing the course, over three years I condensed it down and squeezed it into two years. And randomly, to give you a bit of self-indulgence here, but that's my past Master of Business Administration. I went and found it for the first time uh, for this talk. Uh, I haven't seen it in 15 years, or about 12 years, but this is my master. And I ended up doing that course, uh, three year course in two years. And again, the reason why I'm saying that to you, and I finished top of the class as well, the reason I'm saying that to you is that again, I write to my mom and my dad about that, they, they find it hysterical. 
that this guy who was scraping through his head, lost scraping through his GCSEs, scraping through the A level to get picked out of the university, all of a sudden was doing something like this. But again, that was my learning that you can do whatever you want, whatever you put your mind to. So while I was in Belfast City Hall, I realised my passion for business and technology. And what I then did is wanted to create an event, created something which brought those two things together in the digital DNA. The first ever event, um, the first ever event took place in Titanic Belfast. There's probably about 150 people in the room. It looks very busy. There's probably more people here today. So the event started off quite small. But one of the big things there was this picture here, where we launched the event from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in Wall Street. No way in my world, in my wildest dreams, I ever imagined me standing on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street. And that was also the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange launching this event, Digital DNA. So again, all this mad randoms. I swear there, stuff was happening to me, <laughs> and not being able to work out as to why, but again, it's because I was just throwing everything at it. What we did was we built the event out, and it's now a two day event in George's Market in Belfast, which you're all very welcome to attend this June if you wish. And we've we over a few thousand people who were at that event over two days. We also won a big huge award ceremony in San Cathedral, to recognise all those people in the world of technology who achieved something. Patrick, who's one of the people who has helped put together today, was one of the big winners back in 2018, I believe, as well, for his uh, services to, to IT and technology. One of the big things and where my path is intertwined with St. Romans is that with this thing, digital DNA, um, for me as a kid who was in this school, St. Louis Grammar School, having very little uh, interaction with the outside world, I wanted to create something that would allow kids to see uh, the opportunities that exist. So we created digital futures. And what we did here, this is where the guys, uh, Callum uh, and the other boys who are now second year at uh, university, I was told yesterday. Um, they, these guys won what was second prize that year. We took them off to London. We brought them to Facebook and London and Google, different places. But again, that was just something that I was able to do, a bit of a play thing on the side with this sort of DNA which was, uh, was driving forward. And again, from what I got, these guys have gone on and done amazing things. They came second. Uh, that's a picture of them, a really terrible picture of them you want to find. That's them actually, I think, in Google, uh, just looking out over the city of London whenever the three guys were over, were over there. The first cloud prize that was to bring the kids off to California. So it's all expenses paid. That was four girls from Grosvenor, I was mentioned by Michael there as well. We brought them off to California. And they actually went to the Facebook campus, met with Mark Zuckerberg, Tan Tire, a lady called Jackie Chan, people like that. But again, it's just showing them the world that I could have wanted to see whenever I was a kid. So this is just some of the cool stuff, I guess, that I got to do again. That was an imposter syndrome, was starting to leave a little bit. I was starting to realise the value that I, that I can give. In a bit of time here, so Kairos is a new venture, you might have seen in the first slide. Anybody who's in the rugby, Andrew Trimble, who played for Ulster and Ireland Rugby, Andrew himself has created a company called Kairos, which is a sports technology company which helps elite sports clubs perform better by then, plan out methodically the different scheduling and communications and player performance uh, that, that helps them perform more and more consistently. So what this has allowed me to do is again be at the A1 training complex and I work at Manchester United, which is awesome for me. So the picture which I wasn't allowed to take, but I should look around the A1 complex that day. It's a picture of a fan group. Um, I was in Naples, Florida as well, at an ice hockey convention. So I was talking about ice hockey. The first thing I said was my only understanding of ice hockey is 10 playing NHL on the PlayStation when I was a teenager. But again, I was asked to speak at that conference just about technology. And again, you get the ups and Naples as well, so it's while you're on, while you're doing these wonderful things, you get to take in the world that's around you. Do you work with the GEA and Park, which has been phenomenal as well. Boston, we were at the Boston Red Sox team um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we also been to uh, Facebook in, in California as well. And even with like we have now, we've we played FIFA in the office and build, build things like that. So we've been able to create a world you know, that, that makes me happy and wants to win and work every day. So my learnings very quickly, as a kid, this is me on the right, but the same age as you were. This was the day that we were just leaving school, and you can't see the flower scenes and the egg scenes on, on my uniform here. But I guess if I were you guys, now, the things that I would want you to, to take away, the things that would give you an understanding of the value that you have, number one, surround yourself with a strong circle of friends, right? They're the ones that are going to look after you. I don't mean five hundred followers and Instagram or 5,000, whatever you guys do. A strong circle of friends, and not a big circle, but a strong circle who look after you and keep you right. As Michael said, follow your passion. So I'm a coach for Dara Cross, Gaelic football team, and also for the more rack football team. And every week, I love the idea of going out and coaching those two teams. That's what gives me a, a real sense of value. To do what makes you happy. Find your family. These are my, my uh, three kids here, my wife and my sons over here, James, who's come to, to cringe at his daddy speaking today. But again, the importance of family can't be underestimated. And whenever I was a sick former, I completely underestimated my family. 
and on the rest on the rest of the your mother and father as well, and the massive role that they play in keeping me grounded um, and helping me get to where I want to be. So value your family. Also, don't take life too seriously, right? That's the important thing. There'll be times whenever you think life this is you know, things are desperate right now, where are they going to go? We've all been there, right? And my my view is don't take it too seriously. It all comes in little phases. And finally, Look after yourself, this is me and Naples, one evening with the glass of apple juice, as you can see there. Just chilling, chilling out on the beach, uh, just enjoying life, taking one of those moments to reflect back on all that has been. And last, I would say, to be the best you can be, just taking this picture here, these four girls in California, and being able to impact their lives was a massive, massive moment for me. So, again, be the best you can be. And that's me, two minutes and a half. Thank you very much. creating brand new things. How do you have the bravery to do that, whether it's digital DNA or Kairos or frankly whatever the next thing might be? I don't think it's, uh, bravery is a nice word. I don't know, sometimes it can be stupidity, sometimes it's just being a bit rash with it. I worked in City Hall, I was a good salary whenever I was there. Um, James was just born at the time. Uh, no, his younger brother Thomas was just born at the time. And I decided to pack in that job and want to try something completely brand new. And the next year was terrible. Next year with financial distress, just trying to bring you work out where the next you know, the money was going to come to pay direct debits, etc. And that wasn't necessarily the best time for me to do that in hindsight. So bravery is a nice word to do it. Um, I think just sometimes you just got to grab the app and go for things. And, and again, referring back to what Michael said, if you have that passion for something, you just got to go for it. Or else you're going to be sitting back in a rocking chair someday, somewhere, thinking what could it be. Well, I know one of the things that you've been really good at as well is finding people who you trust to take your babies, whether that's your business or whatever, and let them run with it. That must be really tough. Like Digital DNA has been hugely successful, and when it was at its fastest growing, at its most successful, you actually decided to go do something else and just trust the team that were there. I think there's two sides. I think you know, finding the gas circle of friends, people have talked about finding people that you can trust. And finding people that you can you know, take advice from and it's hugely important. The other side of it as well is you know, people look at all of that and think that was all Gareth. The reality was I was just a person who was getting the right people in to do the job. And my key thing has always been to build out a strong team. And if you look at all the people that are behind any of the ventures that we're involved with, all those individuals are far better than me. Uh, far, far better than I just got the ability, I guess, to pull them together and try and get them sort of head, head in the right direction. Loads to take away. Folks, please join me in thanking Gareth again.